Uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Pankaj Veer Gupta of Veer Mueller Architects, New Delhi. So firstly, can we have a round of applause to welcome him? Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I don't often agree to, to giving these kinds of talks because I've always believed that our work is best experienced in the flesh. Um, and so the physical presence of, of experiencing architecture at a site is so much more powerful than, than sitting in, in an audience and looking at images. But I'll try and do my best to evoke that sense of space and place that um, our work strives to accomplish. So uh, my name is Pankaj Veer Gupta. I'm the founder of Veer Mueller Architects along with my partner, Christine Mueller. We've been practicing together since 2003. We started our office in Massachusetts, where we had lived and worked and studied for several years. And um, since our experience was really grounded in working with large practices in the US that dealt with cultural and institutional buildings, um, it became somewhat a preoccupation for us to return um, to India, where I had lived for 18 years before moving to the US, and try and recreate um, some of that power that, that the making of public place, um, you know, the responsibility of the making of public place that, that falls on our shoulders as architects. Um, the very first project we worked on um, is a building in Pondicherry, which was built in 1939, called Golkond. It was designed by George Nakashima and Antonin Raymond for Sri Aurobindo and the mother as a dormitory in the ashram, an ashram which was devoid of dogma and really believed that human, the human spirit was really uh, in, in striving towards achieving aesthetic and spiritual perfection by the act of making physical beauty manifest in the world. Uh, I'm going to quickly show you a few images that we took in those um, early years of our practice. This, these are images of Golkond. And you can see that in 1939, this is the building that first introduced reinforced concrete to India. And it also was coincident with uh, you know, the catastrophe of the Second World War. So you had a situation in the world where the largest possible conflict was going on, which affected movement of trade and commerce. And so the building had to be built by an American and a Japanese uh, uh, architect in a, in a relatively underdeveloped part of India, using only their skill and their architectural talent and the locally available material. And so you can see that you know, from, from, using architect, uh, from using concrete in architecture for the first time, they were not using it in an obvious way. It was really being used as a plastic element, as an element of sculpture with local black kadapa stone or highly polished Burma teak logs that would highlight the material presence of each of these elements as they formed space collectively. The first cast in place concrete stair. And, and I was, you know, when I first saw this in 2003, I was amazed that even this very first exercise in casting concrete to make an ordinary stair from a laundry terrace to where the clothes were hung was such a profound act of sculptural beauty. The landscape, way before sustainability became a preoccupation and often a, a, a relatively shallow and, and lightly used buzzword. They were making sure, as architects, Nakashima and, and Raymond, that all of the fresh rainwater that fell on these uh, roofs was harnessed and collected in these ponds and then filtered through sand and gravel filters and recycled for watering the garden, for doing laundry, for washing dishes. And this is in 1939, you know, a long time ago. So that ethos of sustainability became deeply influential. And I always show this work because in some ways, the act of doing this research, the act of writing this book, really led us to our first building. And this is a very tiny project. It's a 900 square foot library in the town of Wellesley, just outside of Boston. It's a library for Persian manuscripts um, for a family that had fled Iran uh, at the, over, you know, when the Shah was overthrown. And as part of that royal family, they had lots of miniature paintings and manuscripts, things of great value that they were finally ready to introduce to the world and especially to their two daughters who were growing up and so when Christine and I were asked to do our very first built work, which is this library, we really imagined this as being a civic space, a space where a 16 foot tall ceiling uh, with exposed structure, with bamboo uh, uh, decking for the roofing, exposed concrete floor, would have again a sense of this plastic sculptural quality that we had so admired in Golkon. And 
Also, when you're very young, when you're starting out your own practice, you know, you often tend to lose sight of that one quality that defines great work, and that's the editorial skill. How not to put all your ideas in that first project. So be very restrained, be understated, and really for us, while we were designing this building as a kind of small intimate family space, we also saw it as the marker of a landscape, as, as a lantern in the night that would glow in the neighborhood. Um, there's a little shed behind the building where all the boxes of the paintings and books are stored. So for us, even that little shed became like a, a, a little glowworm, something that would flicker and, 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 and emit some illumination, and yet with this butterfly-shaped roof designed to uh, funnel all the snow and ice in the winter into a cistern underground, all these elements of pragmatics, how do you get rain off a roof, how do you get snow off a roof, how do you light a building well, became part of a kind of sculptural ensemble, as it were. And I would say, um, from that very first project in 2003 uh, to today in 2016, we've never lost track that when we start a project, we are relearning to use a material or a craft or a sense of proportion once again. Um, this is a very small project. Again, you know, a lot of you are young architects. It's always thrilling for me to encourage young people to start their practice because this is a project we did in Kotla. You all know the Kotla hardware market. We were approached by a flooring vendor who said, I have a budget of six or seven lakh rupees to, to do this thousand square foot show, showroom. And we realized we couldn't even afford to buy any material. So we used all the scrap wood that he had left over as slivers from his flooring installations, and we crafted an entire interior just using the slivers of wood. And what, what Mr. Gulati, the owner of the showroom, had said, well, you know, actually in the, in the winter months, my labor burns this wood to keep warm. And so the idea that something that was going to be releasing toxic smoke was actually going to be able to get chiseled and, and funneled into an entire embrace of an interiority down to the fact that each piece can be disassembled just by removing a, a steel screw it was really important for us. So it was you know, like really stitching a, a garment together. We sort of stitched with this wood, this, this interior uh, of the showroom. We made the doors, we made the ceiling, we made the walls, and it really became this kind of interior apparatus. And so when it was finished, you know, people said, well, how did you come up with this? And, and I said, well, one day, many years ago, Christine and I took a walk through the Black Forest in Germany, and we saw through the rain and through the mist little, little drops of light falling through the leaves of trees. And so really the idea of creating an interior that would evoke that sense of forest is how something like this came to play in our imagination. Our very first building in India, we, this is 10 years ago, uh, we were asked by a, by a very fine company in, in Udaipur, outside of Udaipur, um, to, to do an office building. And this is about 4,000 square meters or 40,000 square feet. And you know, we'd never done anything this big before. We'd just recently arrived here. I went to see the site um, and realized that there was not even a construction crane available. There was no construction company. We would have to work with local daily wage laborers. And so again, we thought of Nakashima and Raymond working at Golkond, working with, in 1939, the absence of construction infrastructure, and how would they have done it? And so we took a quick inventory of what was available locally. Uh, we used the local sandstone. We, we created a very, very simple concrete frame structure that could be poured uh, literally by a, making a small batch mixing plant on site. But we never lost sight of the fact that there was a role of history, that Udaipur, the Mewar landscape, is full of these glorious gateways, these giant, amazing thresholds in these forts and palaces. So the idea that 250 people would walk into work every day through a buland darwaza, as you uh, could have it, or, or through a kind of really deep shaded portico, so this very harsh, bright sunshine could be mitigated a little bit. And so the role of history would be channeled through the form of the architecture into a building that would simultaneously mitigate the effect of climate. There's no paint. The building doesn't require any artificial substance to coat it. It's all, it's, it's, mani it, it, it's manifesting the quality of that earth by, by representing that material of the landscape in a different way. So the entire building is clad in this sandstone. The southern facade has, has louvers made of solid pieces of sandstone. Um, the balconies have a two meter deep shadow threshold. So the building uses very, very little air conditioning and more importantly, it gives all the people who work in it 
these beautiful spaces where light is kind of allowed to flicker in, the sun is kind of reduced to this very poetic luminosity, and then the spaces start to become, you know, even ordinary spaces of ascent and descent start to become a more sculptural piece of this kind of theater that the building is, is, is trying to, to accomplish, you know. So, so how do you take very simple sets of volumes and very basic elemental materials and assemble them in a way that the architecture becomes a visible manifestation of culture and light and space. And that's what the building looks like uh, in the evening. This is several years ago that, that you know. But, but again, it, it, you know, after it was finished, it was really wonderful because we became such good friends with the clients that we would go back every year and they would say it had really caused a kind of oasis-like quality to emerge in what was otherwise a fairly desolate, you know, standard in, you know, Indian outskirts landscape. So the point I'm trying to make here is that you can create meaning from craft. You can create meaning in a place when you endow it with the richness and, and, and you endow it with the, with the sensibility that every place geographically inherently has, it contains. Our first residential project, this is a, a house in Defense Colony. And, and when we were starting to design this, you know, I thought of my childhood. I grew up very close to Humayun's tomb in Nizamuddin. And I used to go on these walks with my parents who were architects. And it was always, as a little boy, very inspiring to see the scale of those windows and the scale of those jalis and the scale of, of how deep those thresholds really were. And there was almost like a kind of dream memory. Um, and so when we started to design this house, even though it's a residence, we we felt in no way should the house be uh, any less, playing any less of a role in establishing its primacy on the street, in almost ennobling the street to have that sense of scale, to have that sense of grandeur. And again, we use the most humble material. This is, this is all in, in load-bearing brick masonry. And again, brick, when used as a load-bearing element, is seismically very stable. So we're working in a seismic zone four area, which Delhi is. And so you can see how, again, using just the play of one or two materials, load-bearing brick walls, a little bit of exposed concrete in the lintels, um, and, and then just uh, you know, uh, Rajasthan white marble on the floor, you start to create, again, a, a contradiction between something very refined and polished and something very rough uh, and hewn from the earth. And then that tension is what starts to make space seem powerful. This is just the, the internal stair in the house. But again, it was almost like in our minds we were designing a stair for a museum or a gallery or a civic space. These walls, which now, eight, nine years after it's finished, are adorned with the works of sculpture and art that become, again, uh, possible, make it possible for the space to be a repository of culture. And this is how that light bounces off that marble inside. So outside, what is a dark, brooding, stable presence inside dissolves. And this is all natural light. I mean, even though the, the, the house is kind of deep and only has exposures on the east and the west, you can start to use the inside as a vessel, as a container where the light bounces and plays. And again, using these, the idea of every room having a threshold to the outside. So within the room, a smaller room, and you can see someone sitting on that, on that window ledge. And so the idea that you can start to scale the drama of space on the interior uh, in, in a kind of less conventional way is something that has always intrigued us. And that's, again, the, the presence of the building on the street. How does the street and the architecture establish this dialogue? How does the building look at night? So, so I would say our, our projects are, are designed in a way to act as a foil. This is another project. This is the Embassy of Argentina in Vasant Vihar. Again, here we tried to do a combination of a, of a load-bearing shell and then a frame interior. So again, you get this exterior which is on the street, it's kind of private, it's reserved, it has a little bit of sculptural play with again a singular material, but then on the interior and in the basement it really starts to open up. It's, you know, when you think of a step well in Gujarat, you can also say, well, that can be the precondition for how you change terrain from, from ground plane to the subterranean realm or how you ascend uh, from ground plane to the first level. And so all of these elements, the stairs, uh, the excavation, the sculpting, they become almost geologic in the way that you deal with them as an architect. 
when you float a stair in space, in a double height space, then every single element of that space from its handrail to its sculptural quality, um, it again becomes that, that first sense of plasticity in that stair at Golconde, you know, is, is, is re-evoked. And the idea of this interior being a vessel for light, always natural light. This is a project, this is the head, headquarters of the UN Women in, in Delhi. This is also in Defense Colony, it's a corner site. And so you can see from the photograph, I mean, when I framed the photograph, for me, the, that tree that is across the street from our site was probably more important than our building. And so the idea was that really there was a dialogue between these two protagonists, this great big 200-year-old banyan tree and this relatively uh, you know, new kid on the block, which was this, this house. Um, one of my memories of spending childhood winters in Kashmir was, was, was watching everyone walk around holding these kangris. They were these little clay baskets filled with live coal contained in a wicker uh, insulation. So it's a little basket, you, you, you hold it close to your body, your fabric. And again, that memory was then recreated in the form of the idea that this building has a, is, is like a stone kangri. It has a, it has a stone veil that filters all this intense sunlight but then it also contains this vessel, this vessel that has life inside it. And so that became the kind of conceptual driver for how this house came to be. Again, it's, uh, the exterior is all uh, a sandblasted gualier stone, which starts as a monolith, as a flat plate, but then dissolves into this latticework uh, through which light is emitted and absorbed by day. And then the inside, again, the idea of using very spare, very elemental materials, allowing light, space, and human occupancy to really establish a new landscape on the interior where reflectance and, and temporality are recorded in the way that the material is sculpted and shaped. In many ways, I would say, you know, when I'm asked to characterize what kind of work do you do, my answer is always perplexing. I say we do slow work. We, you know, in a world that is actually fraught with material bewilderment, I mean, you look around at the hall next door and you're staggering around these products, and you really, you start to question how, what, what is the capacity of the human body and the human mind to establish a tactile relationship with material? I think that's a kind of enduring question in the work that Christine and I try and do. And so again, when you come back to the image of a building, for me, this is that kangri, this is that Kashmiri wicker basket glowing with coal inside your firan, because the architecture in some way has to be scaled to intimate acts of occupation and intimate acts of culture. Um, recently, we finished a very large project. This is a university building in Ahmedabad, right next door to Doshi's building, which is the SEPT uh, School of Architecture. Um, it was a national competition. We were very fortunate to win this. And then we were told we had four months to design and issue all the drawings for a 25,000 square meter, 255,000 square foot building. So we had four months team of six architects to do the complete design and all the drawings. So, so the principle was really, again, to keep the building very, very simple. Um, the idea of using wonder and delight to, to have places of surprise for the 3,200 students and the 250 faculty who would call this building home was just as important to us as for me walking through some of these great buildings that we have in the city of Ahmedabad. Um, really in a bizarre way evoked a sense of tragedy because, you know, in this country we don't have a culture of nurturing our buildings. You know, our architecture is not looked after and maintained with the care that it deserves. So even when you go to some of the great works of modern architecture like M IIM Ahmedabad, Lu Khan's wonderful masterpiece, or even Doshi's own building, uh, Institute for Indology, as an architect, you cringe because you know these buildings needed the care and the, and the devotion to uh, maintenance that they just don't have. So for us, that became a kind of absolute, that you know, we were going to design an armadillo in the desert. This building is a tough little building. It is made and expresses its material quality on its sleeve. It's unapologetic about its use of concrete and sandstone. And yet, at the same time, it has the capacity to have a delicacy and evoke some sense of wonder and awe in the students, many of whom coming from very poor rural backgrounds, their first time in a city. It's actually their first real experience of urban architecture. And so, for instance, this, which is a student loggia with a highly polished granite floor and exposed concrete ceiling, it's totally open to the breezes and it's where all the students hang out and gather and debate and talk and play music and eat. So, 
these were not spaces that were given to us by the client in the program. The courtyard was not something that the client thought was important for the project. They were more interested in the classrooms and in the faculty offices and the meeting rooms. We were more interested in using the building as a cultural insertion into the civic and urban fabric of the city. So for me, the gallery walk, the idea that you're walking on a mosaic floor made of the cheapest possible rejected pieces of kadapa and white marble, it's still a carpet. Or Shahir Saab, the great Indian landscape architect, Mohammed Shahir, his absolutely magnificent abstract modernist courtyard, which are these granite plinths, and he imagined these this build, these photographs are taken two years ago. The trees are already much bigger. In 10 years, these trees will fill the courtyard. There will be lots of light dappling through these leaves. There will be lots of bird song and flowers. But the idea that this forest will come to inhabit this very robust stone skin is very important, was important to us. The idea that the stair is a very powerful sculptural snake that's climbing up the building so that as these students are coming in and out of class, they are waving to their friends, they're establish, establishing civic contract um, with a community. So it's not a virtual community. You go to college, you go to a campus to really be celebrating your place in that community. The cafeteria, again, polished marble tables, the stone screen letting in filtered light from the south, the loggia, and really an outdoor living room, as it were, so 2,000 students can gather on that terrace, protected from the rain and the sun, and have a music festival. And that's the building presence on the site with, with the sept building right behind it. I'm going to very quickly end with the last two projects. I know I'm out of time, but please, if, if may I have five more minutes, is that okay? Yeah? Okay. Um, you know, we, we've heard a lot of talk about Swachh Bharat and sanitation, and, and way before that talk became fashionable, um, eight years ago we were hired by a very small NGO called Seva Mandir to design public sanitation infrastructure, uh, which could be used as a model all across the country. So this is a tiny town of Delwara, outside of Udaipur, and we were given a derelict site. It's an old uh, kind of bus repair depot. And, and I made about 23, 24 visits to this village, and often it would only be the 60 or 70 women of the 100 families that live in the village because the men would all go to their put to work. And they said it was an embarrassment. You know, their Bharat would come to marry their family's child, and all the men would get off the bus, and five, five lines of 10 or 20 men would just be urinating. The first act of entry into this village would be urinating on the village wall. And, and, and they said that the humiliation of that was such that they really wanted to do something. And so we decided to use what was cheap and locally available to construct, a, again, a civic space. We built a model in the office that I could carry to that village, and it went from house to house to house. Every single family in that village looked at this model to see if it worked for them. And again, you know, the women said, don't give us a toilet where the door can be locked. We don't feel safe. Don't give us a toilet where there's a man guarding the entrance. We don't feel safe. Give us a, when we go and urinate, we also bathe, we also wash our clothes, we also wash our babies. It was really an amazing thing to understand how do these families in rural India actually carry out their most basic functions. So we designed a very simple concrete frame filled with local stone. Um, we designed a set of bamboo trusses that could be built locally and hammered tin plate steel roofs that could be put on top. And this is what you get. You get a very, again, a very raw space. It, this is a toilet. But we designed the basin so that they could be carved from the stone. This is a village of stone carvers. And, and so even the basins become these stone flowers into which the water can be filled and they can wash their clothes in the basins. They can bathe their babies in the basins. They can chat about their mother-in-law and, and all, the, all the ills that they're facing in their house. But it becomes a civic space. Same thing for the men. It's, it's the toilet be a civic space. It doesn't have to be condemned to this, uh, you know, standard four foot by four foot CPWD issue concrete block, which after three weeks is unusable. All of this is dry composting because we know there's no pumping, there's no electricity, there's no water. So it's dry composting toilet. The water from the rain is collected off the roof, collected in drums. That water is recycled by gravity for washing your hands. Sorry, I'm going to finish very quickly. The last project I want to show you is the museum we're working on for Humayun's tomb, one of the great historical sites in the city. Um, we've been hired by the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. Um, because it's a historical site, we're not allowed to build above the ground. So our only facade, our only elevation is really a facade to the sky. So we decided to design the building as a carpet of stone. 
pit of stone that would mirror the reflection of these great old trees that dot the Nizamuddin landscape, especially in the forecourt of Humayun's tomb. Um, you look at the floor plan and say, where did that weird shape come from? Well, it came from us mapping the root base of every single tree, leaving a six meter offset and realizing that our building will only go where the roots of the trees don't go. So we don't cut a single tree. So when you draw the section, you realize that the entire ensemble of space is really stitched through underground. It takes the symbolic action of taking a public promenade putting it underground, and then illuminating it very carefully. You take the spiritual force of light, and you introduce it into a subterranean chamber, and you can get really amazing qualities of space. And that, that's our museum to scale. So really, as, as magnificent as Humayun's tomb is, as it rises out of the ground, our museum established almost a kind of threshold. You walk through this spatial experience. So you arrive into a court. You have a, calligra a, a calligraphy sandstone wall, which contains a, the, the museum store, the cafeteria, the bookstore, the auditorium. You wa walk under the, uh, the shadow of these glorious old trees, and it's a contemporary building. This is not a replica of Islamic architecture in any way. It's a contemporary building which reinterprets the craft in a meaningful and relevant present. You walk down six meters into the ground, only on ramps. There are no stairs uh, as the major corridor uh, of access. They're all very large ramps, so school children, Two million people visited Humayun's tomb this year. 500,000 of them were school children. So it's really designed for the adults and the children to have a seamless entry into this, the vestibule gallery, where you have light coming down from the sky through these very precisely placed skylights. And this is what the space will look like when it's filled with people. You have natural light illuminating six meters of space, so these relics that have been excavated on the site can be displayed. This is the original finial of Humayun's tomb, which fell in a storm two years ago. That will be the centerpiece of the finial gallery. These are the, one of the emergency exit stairs, and again, the idea that you take something that is utilitarian and make it into uh, a, an amphitheater. And I'm going to end with that because our work really is about representing to you the world that you live in and yet manifest through a very careful and thoughtful use of material and craft. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I ran over time.